He was best friends with Prince Charles and Mia Farrow, and his unique music, which blends Eastern Orthodoxy with the rest of the world's religions, has been performed by Ringo Starr and Bjork. And that's just the tip of this fascinating iceberg. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Sir John Tavener. <laughs> Sir John Kenneth Tavener was born in Wembley, on the northwestern side of London, in January 1944. From an early age, he was exposed to church music. His father was a Presbyterian organist, and Tavener was in the choir at Highgate School, which had a reputation for producing great boys' choirs. Despite persistent rumors, he is not to be confused with Tudor-era English composer John Taverner. Tavener believed that he was Taverner's descendant, but modern genealogical research has proven this otherwise. When Tavener was 17, he was performing piano concertos with Britain's leading youth orchestras and could improvise in the style of any of the great piano composers. He also became a Presbyterian organist like his father, all before he entered college. He attended the Royal Academy of Music starting at age 18, and while there, devoted more and more time to composition until he all of a sudden just wasn't playing piano anymore. He'd always suffered from stage fright, and when he started developing severe back and leg pain, he found it more worth his while to reinvest his musical energies in composition as opposed to trying to push through and still perform. In 1968, Tavener, who had yet to turn 24, scored his first big success with his cantata, The Whale. This piece was based on the biblical story of Jonah and was premiered at the inaugural concert of the London Sinfonietta. This was a landmark moment in British music, but likely wouldn't have done much for British music or even Tavener's career, except for the fact that his younger brother Roger was at that point doing some work on Ringo Starr's home. The Beatles were all far more tuned to contemporary classical music than anyone ever gives them credit for being, and Tavener met Ringo at Roger's house. Roger was convinced that the legendary Beatles drummer would want to eat something fancy, so he went out and got some caviar, and when Ringo showed up, all he wanted was a jam sandwich. The Whale was recorded and released on the Beatles' Apple Records label in 1970, giving it a much wider release than the occasional performance. Ringo participated in the recording sessions, and John Lennon apparently really loved the piece as well, although I can't find record of him being a part of the recording. This was a great break for Tavener, who really appreciated the fact that a major record label was seriously interested in pressing modern classical pieces to disc. Apple released a follow-up next year in A Celtic Requiem, an idiosyncratic, semi-staged take on the traditional Requiem. Tavener's unusual and idiosyncratic reinterpretation of the Requiem Mass led composer Benjamin Britten to help commission an opera from Tavener, who had just recently been appointed as a composition professor at Trinity College at the tender age of 25. The resulting opera, Therese, was unsuccessful because, well, frankly, there just wasn't enough action to justify two hours' worth of content. By this point, Tavener had moved away from his Presbyterian upbringing and had veered closer towards Catholicism. Some sources state that this was because of a love interest who became a nun. Both Therese and his follow-up opera, A Gentle Spirit, from 1977, had libretti by Northern Irish writer Gerard McLarnon. Unusually for the Northern Irishman, McLaren was not Protestant. He was, in fact, Russian Orthodox. And this interest in Russian Orthodoxy, mysticism, and the works of Fyodor Dostoevsky fueled Tavener's interest in Russian Orthodoxy as well. These themes fuel A Gentle Spirit, and it's telling that Tavener converted to Russian Orthodoxy the same year that A Gentle Spirit was completed. Tavener believed that Orthodoxy had a kind of mystical and aesthetic je ne sais quoi that the West lacked. Orthodoxy also provided him with a spiritual homecoming and grounded him in the wake of a disastrous first marriage, which ended after only eight months. From this point on, it wasn't just church music that inspired Tavener, but the specific rites and rituals associated with Orthodoxy. Prior to this, his music could be postmodern and raucous at times. The Whale's take on the story of Jonah is a maximalist soundscape with improvisations, electronic sounds, and pretty much anything that Tavener could find to throw into the piece. From a certain angle, it possesses a feverish and brash quality, not too far removed from certain brands of particularly evangelical Pentecostalism. Eight percussionists manning a huge battery and a five-minute group improvisation was about as wild as Tavener ever got. Let's be real, that's pretty wild. His conversion coincided with, and one can say was definitely related to, his change in style. He thought of the whale and pieces like it to be a result of a young composer being angry at a classical world that took itself far more seriously than it should, and of a world at large which never took the metaphysical into enough account. 
As a result, the whale is more rock opera than the rest of his output, and while it's a fun piece, it's not representative of what the Taverner style is. Taverner's compositional process usually meant finding a metaphysical theme he wanted to explore, finding texts which fit that theme, and then finally setting that text. As a result, most of his pieces are choral or contain choral elements. Being a choral composer means that you are limiting yourself. It comes with its own set of challenges because no, there are certain choirs out there who can do non-functional chords and can sing atonally and even do quarter tones, but most choirs can't do that. So usually choral composers are going to be more rooted in tonality or modality. Typically they're going to be a lot more diatonic than other composers could be. Taverner's music isn't easy to sing, but he grew up in that tradition. He was a choral singer himself. So even if they're not easy to sing, they're at the very least idiomatic. Of his non-choral works, the most famous is probably The Protecting Veil a 45-minute work for cello and string orchestra. Here, even though the religious element isn't explicitly sung, it's still there. The title refers to an orthodox feast. Its premiere at the BBC Proms in 1989 put Taverner at the center of British high cultural life, a position of fame he would enjoy for the rest of his life. In 1997, his Song of Athene was heard at the end of Princess Diana's funeral. His music has a tendency towards very high registers for the main vocal or instrumental lines. The Protecting Veil, for instance, has the solo cello rarely going outside of its very high register, and he tended to avoid writing for the woodwinds. When he wrote for instruments and orchestras, he generally preferred the brass, percussion, strings, and organ. The music he wrote after his conversion could still contain hints and bits and pieces of this earlier wildness, especially in the instrumental parts but was largely more toned down and reserved. Yet even beyond this stylistic turning point away from maximalism in the 1970s, he was still capable of writing really, really big pieces when he needed to. Look no further than 2003's The Veil of the Temple, which takes about seven hours to perform. My goodness, what would Morton Feldman think? I'll tell you what, you make it eight and a half hours, and I'll buy you a beer. The Veil of the Temple was, in Tavner's own words, the supreme achievement of his life, and not without good reason. It's one of the longest classical pieces ever composed. The Temple Church wanted to commission a work that would put them on the map, musically speaking, since they were founded by the Knights Templar, and Tavener thought back to the all-night vigils of churches a thousand years prior. But it's not just an Orthodox piece, or even an exclusively Christian piece. Even though it is about, ultimately, the cosmic ascent of Christ, it does so in a way that encompasses so many different religious traditions and styles as almost mind-boggling. The huge score was accompanied by a 274-page book of performance schematics and choreography, where the performers would go during this seven-hour ritual. His ability to write so much stems from his unique habit of simply not revising his scores. He would often spend months not writing anything, working on a piece in his head and mulling it over, and then finally when he decided to commit it to paper, he didn't have to make any edits to it. By 2000, when Tavener was knighted, he started to become weary of writing music strictly in the orthodox tradition, of being an orthodox composer, so he decided to really stretch out and see what other things he could incorporate. This could be as simple as including unusual instrumentations in his orchestras, or going and setting texts which are from decidedly non-orthodox sources like 2007's The Beautiful Names, which is a setting of the 99 names of God found in Islam. This stylistic shift in the 21st century led some to believe that Tavener had abandoned orthodoxy, but Tavener said that this wasn't the case. People assumed that his music was so bound up in his orthodoxy that he couldn't separate the two, and I think he kind of wanted to prove that he could. He moved away from orthodox music while still believing in orthodoxy as a faith tradition. He said that he just wanted to explore more universal themes in his work. In discussing The Beautiful Names, Tavener said, said that it wasn't just other faith traditions that inspired him, it was the very sound of other languages themselves that he found musical. The Veil of the Temple includes Hindu scripture and begins with a love poem ascribed to an Islamic Sufi mystic. This move was not without a toll in his personal life. He was afraid that this move towards universalism, and particularly his embrace of Islamic texts, would render him a pariah in a post-9-11 world. This largely didn't come to pass. He did, however, lose a friendship with Mother Thecla, an abbess at an Orthodox monastery who had acted as a spiritual mentor to Tavener in the 1980s, and who had been his librettist for a number of pieces. She had understood his need to pare down texts to their essence, sometimes, in the case of Doxa, 
to just one word. His move away from strict orthodoxy in his music had led to this severed relationship. Tavener lamented Western music's lack of what he called an esoteric dimension. He thought Western music had come closest to embracing this esotericism in plain chant. Even the great religiously inspired works of the West to Tavener expressed human truths as opposed to spiritual truths, and he looked no further than Beethoven's epic Missa Solemnis as the ultimate expression of this human truth. To him, these big grandiose pieces weren't about truly expressive spirituality at all. Tavener's beliefs didn't require him to express the divine with grandiose statements, but rather with the still, small voice within. This childlike innocence that he wanted in his music was a feature, not a bug. To Tavener, very little in the Western tradition had theretofore expressed this kind of esotericism and mysticism. And coincidentally, the first opera he'd ever gone to see was Mozart's The Magic Flute, and he thought that this was one of the few pieces in the canon that did this. Tavener was always in poor health and suffered from various maladies throughout the course of his life. His six and a half foot frame was the result of Marfan syndrome, a genetic disorder of the connective tissue of the body, which may have also affected both Sergei Rachmaninoff and Niccolo Paganini, although the jury's still out on those two pretty much permanently. As a direct result of what Marfan syndrome can do to the heart, he had two heart attacks. He'd suffered a stroke in his 30s, which left him temporarily paralyzed, and in the 1990s he had both heart surgery and a tumor removed from his jaw. His lifelong health struggles always meant that he was likely to die earlier than most, and he did in November 2013 at the age of 69 just a few days after giving his last interview. By the end, he needed over a dozen pills a day to keep himself going. Tavener's music has a very distinct character, influenced in part by the Stravinsky and Messiaen that he heard in his formative years. As time went on, he was less and less likely to use these composers' techniques in his work, preferring a more personal approach to the traditional diatonic system. In particular, his exploration of orthodox music led him to orthodox modes, which are far more complicated and far more integrated into the liturgy itself than the church modes that we think of that emerged out of the Roman Catholic tradition. The use of Byzantine music is, in its original context, inflected and decorated microtonally, meaning that his most Byzantine music is off-limits unless you're a professional choir. Singers beware, microtones in Tavener's scores can sometimes look like plain old accidentals. This is why you read the performance notes, kids. On a surface level, this bears some similarity to orthodox icons, which are two-dimensional in nature, that is, without the use of perspective. And Tavener's music presents us with melody, working in a limited number of musical dimensions by largely leaving harmony to the incidental overlaying of melodies. For this reason, the term icons in sound is often used to describe Tavener's music. Because of his deeply religious influences, Tavener's music is often classed into a sub-branch of minimalism called holy minimalism, typically alongside Estonian composer Arvo Pärt. While there are links between them, unlike many more modern tonal composers, Tavener held a deep-seated appreciation for some of the most strenuous arch-modernists of the 20th century, including Anton Webern and Elliot Carter. He called the latter the greatest American composer that has ever lived. Which, I mean, come on. Charles Ives is, is right there, but... He liked them because, to Tavener, these were two composers who didn't try to force their subjective opinion on their musical materials. They simply let the music go where it needed to go. I mean, his main criticism of the 20th century, after all, was that composers were too decadent. Composers were too willing to be subjective in their pieces. He was good friends with Prince Charles, who found in Tavener a kindred spirit and religious universalism and would commission works from him. He wrote a piece for Bjork in 2000 and was friends with Mia Farrow, with whom he bonded over their shared sense of spirituality. Farrow called him her spiritual soulmate, and stories abound of them getting up to crazy hijinks together, like waking up a priest at two in the morning because she wanted to play an organ, or stopping and leaving a rental car in the middle of a traffic jammed highway. He was known for his love of cars, and a newspaper once called him the mystic who drives a Rolls Royce. His commercial success and embrace of all things diatonic have led some to criticize his music for not being challenging enough, or catering to a popular demand for easy listening contemporary works. But for Tavener, the music that he wrote was an extension of his beliefs and his deep-seated need for communicating urgently. His struggles with health and the near-death experiences he had, especially towards the end of his life, also informed this need. During a six-month stint in intensive care, again towards the end of his life, he said that his ability to sense music and sense God had weakened in his impaired physical condition. So for Tavener, music and belief were really just two sides of the same coin. 
Unusually among composers, Tavener was less concerned with interpretations of a score than, well, most any of us I can name, which conductor Stephen Layton appreciated when faced with the 850-page score to The Veil of the Temple. As Tavener said of that piece, I didn't try to make it, it came from inside me. He was not particularly evangelical, and regarded the praises of those who didn't share his faith, or any faith at all, as a high honor as he felt that this was proof of his music being able to directly reach listeners on a spiritual level. God shows himself in everything that lives, he said, including the sublime language of music. <laughs>